So this is the intro video for Lab 6 of the AppSci 1299 Labs, and today we're studying timers. There is, again, some pre-lab reading that you should do before coming to the lab, so you should read Chapter 11 of the CHIPS data sheet, and you can get that off of the website. In Part A, we're going to be looking at non-blocking delays. So all of the delays we've used so far just stop your code for a certain interval of time, and after that time has elapsed, then things can proceed. That's not always what you want, because sometimes you'd like to continue doing things with your code while you're waiting for that interval of time to pass, and this is where timers come in useful. Now, as the manual outlines very nicely, you can use these timers in two different ways. You can either set the timer to some initial value and let it count up to its maximum value, at which point a flag is set and you can detect that fact with your code, or you can set the timer to an initial value of zero and just keep checking it to see whether it's gotten to a certain number or not. You're going to be looking at a piece of code called usingtimers.c that uses the timer in both of these ways. Here is where the manual gets into the nitty gritty of how you use the timers. So there's four functions here, close timer, open timer, write timer, and read timer. And all of those are appended with the numeral zero because we're using timer zero. Open timer may look a little familiar to you. Remember when you were using the PWM module, you had to set the prescale value? The function you used was called open timer 2. So this week, you find out how to use timers in detail. Open timer configures the timer for your use. Write timer is where you write an initial value to the timer. Read timer reads the instantaneous value of the timer, and close timer shuts everything down. So let's talk about open timer. This is where you configure everything for your use, and there is a variable you need to put in. What's going to be a little unusual looking is that the variable is going to be a bunch of different defined names that are just anded together. Uh, they've set things up so that you can just take a bunch of different settings and turn them all on at the same time. So those predefined names are all down here. Some of these are mutually exclusive. You can't use them at the same time and some of them can be used at the same time. So the first two are timer int off and timer int on. These are if you want to use an external interrupt to stop the timer. We're not going to be doing that, so we're always going to use timer int off. The next two options are to set the timer to be a 16-bit timer or an 8-bit timer, and obviously you can get larger time scales if you use it as a 16-bit timer. It just gives you a higher maximum value. The next two are also mutually exclusive, like the other two pairs have been. So TO source internal, TO source external. What are those? So the timer has to be triggered to count by something. If you're using the internal source, then the trigger is going to be the chip's own internal clock. If you're using source external, then the trigger that makes the timer count up is going to be some square wave that you send into the chip. We're actually going to be using both of these. So to begin with, you use the chip's own clock to trigger the timer to count. That'll be what happens in the using timers.c code. And then later, at the very last part of the experiment, we're going to send in the square wave to the chip and use that to trigger the timer to count. The next two are also mutually exclusive. TO edge rise, TO edge fall. Those only get used if you're using an external source to trigger your timer. So if you're sending in a square wave to trigger the timer to count, then you need to tell it whether it should start counting on the rising edge or the falling edge of that square wave. All the rest of these are prescale values that you can set. So what a prescaler is for is that you can have the timer triggered by the chip's internal clock, and you can have the timer count up one for every beat of the clock, so one to one. Or you can say, let four beats of the chip's internal clock pass before the timer counts up one. And obviously, a larger prescale of value is then going to allow you to access longer periods of time, because you let a certain number of clock cycles pass before the timer goes up one. Now, scrolling down, here there's an example of open timer where everything gets configured. And like I said, these things just get anded together. So they've got timer int off, and then an and symbol, and then TO source internal, and then an and symbol, and TO 16-bit, and then another AND symbol, and then TO prescaler 32 times. So they've set all of these things at the same time just by ANDing them together. So now I want to show you a little bit of using timers.c. You get quite a bit more code than just this, but I'm going to look specifically at the while1 loop. Now this while1 loop is actually split into two parts. 
you're going to be sending a square wave to your LED to turn it on and off. And one half of the while, one loop takes care of turning the LED on for a certain period of time, and the other half takes care of turning it off for a certain period of time. So I'm going to zoom in on this just so you can see it a little better. And now we'll talk about what each part of this does. So as mentioned earlier, we're going to be using timers in two different ways. We start by configuring the timer to begin with. So they use this open timer zero function. And they've set the external interrupts off because we don't need those. They've set the source to internal. So we're using the clock of the chip. And they've set it to be a 16-bit timer. And they've set a prescale value of 32. The next thing they do is they clear the flag. So there is this variable here. This is the name of the flag that gets set when the timer runs over its maximum value. So this portion of the code is going to watch for that flag to be set. So they clear the flag, set it to 0, and when the timer reaches its maximum value, this flag will go to 1 and we'll be able to detect that fact. The next thing they do is they flip the polarity of the LED. So they're turning it on by flipping the polarity of one of the pins that is attached to the LED. The next thing they do is they use write timer to set the initial value of the timer. And finally, we've got this while loop, which is going to take care of keeping things going until the right period of time has elapsed. Now, I've grayed out two lines of code here because they're not important to how this while loop works. I'll talk about these later. So the while loop just checks that flag and makes sure that it's still set to low. So as long as the flag is low, this while loop keeps running, and that's what controls how long the LED is on for. This comment inside the while loop explains what the time period is going to be. So the maximum value for a 16-bit chip is this number, 65536. We set the initial value of the timer to this one, 25536. So 1 minus the other is how many times the timer will count for before it reaches its maximum value. And then to turn that into a time, they multiply by 32, because that was the prescale value here, times TCY, and that gives you a time interval of 0.16 seconds. So the LED will be on for 0.16 seconds. So now scrolling down to the off portion of the pulse. So again, they configure the timer with open timer. The external interrupts are still off. The source is still the internal clock of the chip. It's still a 16-bit timer, but they've changed the prescale value in this case to 16. And they note up here in the comment that you can do that at any point. This portion of the code doesn't use the flag, so they don't bother clearing it. So they just flip the polarity of the LED again, and then they write the initial value of the timer. And this time, they're just going to write it to 0. And the while loop, which takes care of keeping things running until that time period has elapsed, is just going to keep reading the timer with this read timer function and checking whether the returned value has reached 40,000 yet. This comment down here, again, explains how the time period is calculated. So the while loop is going to keep running until the read timer returns a value of 40,000 or more. So it's going to be 40,000 minus 0, because our initial value is 0 and then times 16, because that was the prescale value here, times TCY gives it a time period of 0.08 seconds. So the LED is going to be off for 0.08 seconds. So it's on for 0.16 seconds. It's off for 0.08 seconds. That means it's got a duty cycle of 67%. So now let's talk about these two grayed out lines. So this demonstrates why timers are really useful, in that we can be waiting for a certain period of time to elapse, and we can still be executing code while that's going on. So these should look fairly familiar to you. We've got this variable, has switch one changed, and we set it to be equal to the returned value of a function, monitor digital input one for edges. And then down here it says, if has switch one changed, been set to one, then you execute a function called switch LED color. And this is a function that's been given to you. It's just a very simple function that flips the polarity of both of the pins that the LED is attached to. So let me now scroll down to the instructions. And they say, first of all, carefully read the usingtimers.c program and make sure you understand its operation. One of the best ways to do that is to create what's called a timing diagram. So I'm going to pause the video right now and show you one of those, and then we'll come back here. So this is an example of a timing diagram. So what I've done is I've got three graphs, and I put them all on the same piece of paper, and they've all got the same horizontal time scale. Each of these graphs represents something different on my circuit. 
these two graphs represent the two pins that my LED is connected between, and this last one represents the button. So the way the code is written in using timers.c, the code takes care of turning on the on and off cycle of this pin, and it can also handle flipping the polarity of this pin. What controls flipping that polarity is a button push. So these two pulses represent somebody physically pushing the button down. So what's going on with these two pins is completely controlled by the code, and what's going on here is completely controlled by a human being, so it's basically random. Now I'm going to go through how this explains using timers.c, but honestly listening to me talk about it isn't nearly as useful as you actually doing it yourself, so I strongly recommend you make your own timing diagram for using timers.c, so that you personally figure out where things go high and low, because that, more than listening to me talk, will help you understand how that code functions. So the code turns the LED on for 0.16 seconds, then it turns it off for 0.08 seconds, then it turns it back on, then it turns it back off, and so on. If nobody pushed the button, it would just keep doing this indefinitely. When a human being pushes this button down, what the code does is it flips the polarity of both of these pins. So if this one was low, it goes high. If this one was low, which is completely random, it also goes high. When the 0.08 seconds has elapsed, the code is still going to flip the polarity of this pin. And if you think about it, it's still turning the LED on because we've now got high here and low here. So current is still going to flow, it's just going to flow in the opposite direction to the way it was doing here. So when the person pushes the button down, it basically changes the color of the LED. So the code again continuously turns the LED on and off for the set intervals of time. Then the human being pushes the button down again. That flips the polarity of this guy, it goes from high to low, and it flips the polarity here as well, which goes from low to high. Again, when the regular time interval expires, the code is going to flip the polarity of this pin, so it just keeps cycling up and down, but now, because this one's low, it's going to turn on when this one is high, and the current is flowing the opposite direction. Okay, so we're back. So you've got this using timers.c program, you compile it, you load it onto your chip, and you use a two-way LED with this. The reason why is that the program has functionality such that you can push a button and change the color of the LED, which means you need to be using the right sort of LED. The next instruction says, try to think of ways to make using timers.c a more efficient program. And remember, an efficient program is one that doesn't execute lines of code that it doesn't need to. So for example, with your LCD screen, you can update the screen every single time the while one loop executes, but that's really inefficient. What you really should be doing is updating your LCD only when it has a change to report, and you've actually done this in previous labs. So you're going to try and think about this sort of the same way. Is there anything that you could shuffle around such that you're not going to be executing a line of code more often than it needs to be executed? And the last instruction says, for each prescale of value, determine the maximum interval that we can time if our chip's running at 32 megahertz. So you calculate those all out and put them in a table. In part B, you're going to flip the current direction back and forth very rapidly. The reason why is if you do it on a short enough time scale, then the human eye is going to blur the red and the green together to make sort of a yellowy-orangey color. Although I'll warn you, you have to look straight down at the top of the LED to see that effect. Viewed from an angle, it doesn't quite look the same. You're going to take using timers.c and modify it such that you have a period of 0.1 milliseconds, and 35% of the time the LED will be lit up red, and 65% of the time it'll be lit up green. And then pushing a button is going to switch things so that it's lit up red 65% of the time and green 35% of the time. So in part C, you're going to create a photogate timer. So you've probably used photogates in your physics labs. It's just a device that sends an infrared beam across a gap, and if some object breaks the beam, then you can set up a timer that will time how long that beam was blocked for. So you're going to create code that actually can do this. At the bottom of this page, it gives you the logic for how your program should roughly work. Uh, so when the signal from the photogate is high, that means that the photogate is not blocked. So you're going to have a pin monitoring that signal, and as long as that signal remains high, your code does nothing. As soon as the code detects a falling edge, however, it needs to start the timer. And at that point, 
it then needs to monitor the timer and also monitor the signal at the same time. The reason why is that if the timer rolls over, if it overflows and goes past its maximum value, you need to stop and provide an error message on your LCD screen. And, scrolling down, if it doesn't roll over, then you need to calculate how long the photo gate was blocked for and display that time in milliseconds on your LCD screen. And when you're finished with everything else, you go back to monitoring the input signal so that you could measure another blockage of the photo gate. Now they note down here that if you're not in the lab at the time when you're doing this part of the experiment, you can substitute a button for the photo gate. The only difference is that a button goes high when it's pressed, and that would be the interval that you need to time, whereas the photo gate goes low when it's blocked, which is the interval you're supposed to time. So you just have to take into account that the signal you're measuring would be flipped. In part D, you're going to create code that will act as a counter. Specifically, you're going to be counting how many times you've pushed a button down. So you're counting button pushes. The way in which you do that is, first of all, by remembering that up till now we've been using the chip's internal clock to trigger the timer. Now we're going to choose an external source, that is an external square wave, and use that to trigger our timer. So in order to do that, you have to hook up the external square wave to pin 6 for timer 0. And you may be thinking, okay, what is this square wave we're going to use? Well, it's just the output of the button. So you hook up your button to pin 6, and then every time you push the button down, that rising edge, or that falling edge, depending on how you set things up, will trigger the timer to increment once. So read through this to make sure you're setting everything up right. They give you some tips, such as the fact that you should choose a prescaler of 1, and you're going to create code such that it counts the button presses, and it displays the current count on your LCD. They also ask you to consider what would happen if you used a prescaler other than one. So if you used two, for example, how would that change things?